If you spent any time with a computer at all, then you have more than likely seen this or something like it. What do you think of that symbol? Messed up again? <laughs> Hurry up. Come on, come on, come on, come on. D does anyone in here enjoy waiting? Waiting is tough. What evidence do you have that our modern world has a difficult time waiting? Besides looking at something like that and going, hurry up, hurry up. Honking your horn. The, the, the light turns green and a second passes and the guy isn't going anywhere. Go. Go. Getting, getting credit for, oh, so we want the money now and we'll pay it later. No, no waiting. What, what else back here? Checkout lines. Oh, we just went through the holiday season. Did you do like I did and you counted how many were in this line and then you counted which one was in that line? And, and besides that, you checked to see what was in the basket. Because if it was like this, then you want to get in this one. Or if you went to the self-checkout, if you, if you get into the self-checkout, you notice this one has four self-checkouts, and this one over here has eight. And so let me see, and this one's got, oh man, I went through all sorts of mathematical equations to make sure I picked the right checkout line. And then after I did, I'd always get behind the one that did not move as fast as the others. Waiting is tough. What else? How do you know that we have a hard time waiting? <laughs> In case you did not hear that, let me repeat it. When the sermon goes too long, at what point do you start going like, hmm, hmm? But you want to do it very discreetly. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah, we have a hard time. We uh we want fast food. In fact, especially we've got one restaurant in town. It's a fast food place that we go to fair every once in a while, but there are several times that they haven't opened up the dining room yet. And um, I think part of that is because they don't have the workers in place to be able to handle everything inside. And so they will, you know, they'll have the cars that line up for the drive through And there's like 10, 15 cars in that drive through They got a lot more patience than I do. I'm not going to wait for that. Microwave cooking. How many of you use your microwave a little too often? Yes. In fact, um, it was funny, whenever Angela and I got married, microwaves hadn't been out that long, but... Her, uh, her mother had, had fallen in love with the microwave, so when we got married, um, Angela had to learn all over again what it meant to cook with the oven and the stove and that sort of thing. Everything was done in the microwave. Uh, email and texting. You ever texted somebody and then gotten upset because you didn't get it right back? Why don't they answer me? You're supposed to do that right now. You can go to an ATM. You can go and make sure you get your cash back right there as you're using your card at the register. Um, high-speed internet. When was the last time you upgraded your internet? That's just too slow. We've got to have something faster. Streaming services. You notice you don't go down to the Blockbuster video and rent a video anymore. That takes too much time. And they went out of business because of that. You can get it immediately on your streaming service. Um, and who would ever sit through a commercial that lasted longer than 30 seconds? Waiting is awful. But as much as we hate waiting in our modern world, I want us to understand, and we're going to learn this from the life of Joseph today, that if you're going to be a child of God, you need to get comfortable with waiting. Because God uses waiting 
for his purposes. There are things that God wants to do with waiting that cannot be done any other way. For those of you that are visiting today, we've been going through a study of Joseph and noticing how God gave him strength during his times of difficulty, during his times of trouble. And trying to gain those lessons about what we then can do and how God can give us strength whenever we have those times of trials and difficulties in our lives. And we've noticed in Joseph's life how Uh, In Joseph's case, God gave him the strength to rise above his circumstances. That even though he was sold into slavery after being a favored one at home, and then in, in his being a slave, even though he rose to prominence and to responsibility, how Mrs. Potiphar tried to tempt him away from that and finally falsely accused him so that he went into prison, how each one of those ups and downs, he was able to rise above his circumstances and to serve God regardless of what was thrown his way. We noticed in Joseph's life how he lives faithfully with godly character regardless of the circumstances. His integrity was strong. His godly character was strong. There, there must have been something that he learned from Jacob and, and what Jacob told him about this God of his forefathers that, that, that Joseph, that, that sustained him throughout all of his difficulties. And he lives strong in that godly character and that got him through so many of those trials and difficulties. And we notice how Joseph resisted bitterness, how he resisted resentment. How he did not allow himself to be eaten alive by by depression and disappointment. Instead, he turned it over to God. He learned to trust God with all of those circumstances. But the question I've got whenever I get to Joseph's life is why the waiting? Remember, Joseph started out with those two dreams. And those two dreams were dreams that someday he was going to be in an important position. He was going to be in a spot that that others would bow down to him. But why wait? He he got to Egypt um, and, and through very difficult circumstances, but why not take care of it then? Why wait? And isn't it true in our own lives that there are certain things that we would like to have happen in our lives? There are certain things that we want for our lives, and I just sit back and say, God, why the waiting? Why not just now? You've made promises. You, you, you said that you'd be with me. You said that you would bless me. Why do I have to wait? And, and especially during those times of trials and difficulties and, and challenges in our lives, whenever things are not going so well anyway, why do you make me wait even longer Especially then, why wait? Maybe what Joseph didn't know was when he wound up in prison, during that prison experience, that God was using that period of waiting to prepare Joseph for something very important. By the way, I gave my class last week a trivia question. question. I'll ask all of you now, how long was Joseph in Egypt before he went and served in Pharaoh's court? You remember? How long do you have to wait? Because um, we read the story and it looks like and you see this event and it goes this event and it goes this event and just and boom, boom, boom. Kind of like you watch a 30-minute you know, uh, TV show on TV and everything gets resolved there in two minutes. Or you watch a movie, everything gets resolved there in two hours. How long did things start getting resolved for Joseph? Well, if you get the beginning of the story, he was sold into Egypt at the age of... 17. You go to Genesis chapter 41, and you go down to verse 46, and the account tells us that Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. From the time he was sold into slavery, he served in Potiphar's house, he was placed in prison and and had to stay put in prison, was 13 years. Think back, what were you doing 13 years ago? What have you had to wait for? So let's learn some things about Joseph's period of waiting. How many of you remember this? How many of you are old enough to remember that picture? What's that from? Yeah, the Iranian hostage crisis. Now, for those of you younger, 
little bit of history here. Back in 1980, 79-80, rebels, uh, uh, terrorists took over the country of Iran. They deposed the Shah of Iran that had been friendly and an ally of the United States. Well, they got rid of him and they they took over the country in a violent coup and, and supported the Ayatollah Khomeini as the new religious and government leader, political leader of, of Iran. And when they did so, they stormed the U.S. embassy and uh, they took 52 Americans hostage. And they kept those 52 Americans hostage for 444 days. Those of us who will remember this, remember sitting at night, night after night after night. So whenever the, night, the uh, news program late at night called Nightline got started. And each night it would start out day number 12, day number 13, day number 52, day number 300. And we all wondered, would these hostages be able to come home? We tied yellow ribbons around trees all over the place, around posts everywhere as a reminder of those 52 hostages so that when they would be able to come home, they would know that we were thinking about them. We were praying for them. They were being remembered by us. But what about the experience of those hostages? Those questions about what would their future hold? Did they have a future? As they sat in seclusion, as they sat and waited Would they have a tomorrow, or would they be put to death as hostages there in Iran? They had to have wondered about their family back home, worried about their their, uh, their feelings, their emotions, their their well-being. How are they doing? And, and, And wondering, you know, what are they doing while they wait for us to come home? Are they praying for me? Are they hoping for me? What is it that they are doing? And they must have been thinking, what is the government doing to win my release? When am I going to be able to come home? For over a year, those 52 hostages sat there and waited. What about Joseph? Remember, he's sitting here in a prison and in in slavery for 13 years. What must it have been like for him? I wonder what what questions he had about his future. Yeah, he had had these dreams, but maybe they were just fanciful dreams. Maybe they really didn't mean anything. Or were they really promises from God? Was there really a future for him? He thought so in Potiphar's house, and then that all fell to pieces. And then he winds up in prison. Well, who's going to get out of prison? Especially a Hebrew in an Egyptian prison. But things are looking a little better for him. He starts getting some responsibility, but this, has got to, this may be the best it gets. Maybe this is where they're going to bow down to me here in this prison. But in that seclusion, there's no family waiting. For all that Jacob knows, Joseph is dead. For all his brothers know and care, he's dead. There's nobody waiting for him back home. There's nobody praying for him back home. There's nobody working to try to get him back home. In fact, there is nobody outside of his family working for his release. For 13 years, he's waiting, and what hope does he have? And then when we get to chapter 40 of Genesis, Joseph gets a ray of hope. Because up until now, there has been no tangible hope, nothing for him to hold on to. And then in verse 40, sometime later, no, chapter 40, starting in verse 1. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. Now, we read behind behind the scenes just a little bit, what the text doesn't tell us, it would seem that what has happened, this, this chief cupbearer, which in, in the language of a cupbearer, this is not just somebody who's going to hand the king his cup to drink. I mean, he's got to be somebody that the king can really trust. He's going to taste the drink first to make sure there's nothing poisonous in the drink. But beyond that, he is a, a trusted advisor to the king. He is one the king leans on. You might remember Nehemiah 
who uh, uh, came back to uh, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He was the cupbearer to the king, a trusted advisor to, uh, to the king. The baker, another trusted person in the, uh, the, the royal household because he prepares the food. You've got to trust him to be able to prepare good, healthy food, not something that's going to, to do something to the Pharaoh. But there, there must have been some conspiracy that took place, and the Pharaoh found out about it. Someone is trying to assassinate him, trying to do him harm. And in order to dis- investigate this, be able to find out what's going on, he places these two trusted individuals in prison while the investigation is happening. And after they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. They had two dreams. And Joseph comes up to him, verse 6, and and came to them the next morning. He saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. They have these two dreams. One dream is a dream that condemns the man. The baker has a dream, and it's going to be one that's going to end in his death. But the cupbearer has a dream, and it's one that is going to indicate that that he's going to be restored. He's going to be back in Pharaoh's favored position. He's going to be back as one of Pharaoh's advisors. Notice verse 12. This is what it means as he talks to the cupbearer. The three branches are three days, and within three days, Joseph will lift up your head and restore you to your your position. You will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Joseph sees a glimmer of hope. He's able to prove that God uses him to interpret dreams. And out of a, 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 an appreciation for this, in, this good interpretation, Joseph says, remember me to Pharaoh. I know that you're special to Pharaoh. I know you have his ear. I I know that he'll listen to you. When you go and see Pharaoh, remember me. Remember what I did for you and, and return the favor because I don't belong here any more than you do. Remember me. And then we remember from verse 23, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. There was a glimmer of hope, but then reality hits. And the reality is, he's got to stay in prison at least two more years. You ever had those times? Where you thought things were finally looking up. You thought things were finally going to go your way. You thought God was going to finally answer that prayer that you had been praying so earnestly day after day after day only to feel like you've been forgotten. What do you do in those situations? What is God doing? Why does God make us wait? I want us to notice what God was doing whenever Joseph was waiting. Number one, God was providing the right circumstances for Joseph. What do you think Joseph would have done if he been released from prison right that moment? Instead of two years later, what, what do you think would have happened? Well, if Joseph had been released in year 11, as he had hoped then Joseph probably would have left Egypt and gone back to Canaan, don't you think? He wouldn't have stayed around in Egypt. There was nothing for him there. Joseph would not have been around for Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh didn't have his dreams for another two years. Joseph would not have been there to help him out with them. 
And then Pharaoh would not have compared Joseph's God-given wisdom with the lack of wisdom of the other wise men that were in his court. There would have been no Joseph there. Joseph then would not have been promoted in Pharaoh's court. He would not have been put in second in command. Therefore, there would have been no relief from this famine that was about to come, not just in Egypt, but worldwide. And Joseph's family would have perished in Canaan. Having Joseph wait like this was providing the right circumstances that God knew were coming in order for Joseph to be used for God's purposes. And if there had not been the waiting, the right circumstances would not have come about. Number two, God was developing God confidence in Joseph. Have you, have you noticed the, the progression of Joseph's growth as you go through the story? Go back to, to chapter 37. We, we noticed this somewhere. We, we talked about these initial dreams that Joseph had. Um, and notice, uh, Joseph, it doesn't seem like, has been anyone who has, has suffered from self-confidence. Would you agree with that? I mean, he had always seemed to be pretty self-confident, pretty confident about how he could do things. Uh, verse, chapter 37 um, verse 5, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. And you, 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 maybe he was being naive and just kind of sharing something that he knew, but he knew his brothers didn't like him. He knew his brothers resented him. Why would he share this dream? He's got... A little bit too much confidence about himself. He, he shares it again in verse, verse 9. He had another dream. He told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And what I want you to notice is there's really no mention of God here, is there? I had a dream. Look what's going to happen to me. Go over to chapter uh, 38. Chapter 38, we notice he starts learning a few things about what God, how, what, about his relationship with God. I'm sorry, verse, chapter 39 is where we want to go. Because Mrs. Potiphar is, is harassing him day after day after day to come to bed with her. And in his explanation of why he would not do that, notice verse 8 of chapter, of chapter 39. He refused. He said, with me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. Notice again, it's quite a bit about him, isn't it? No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? It's still very much about Joseph, but... He also understands a responsibility that he has to God. Then go to chapter 40. In chapter 40, he's been in prison now, and, and been in slavery and been in prison for 10 or, or 11 years. And uh, these two dreams are had by the cupbearer and by the baker. And in verse, um, verse 8... They tell him, we both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. It's not, hey, I can tell you what those dreams mean. God will tell me. No, interpretation belongs to God. Tell me your dream. And then chapter 41. Pharaoh has these dreams. And the cupbearer remembers, oh yeah, there's Joseph in there. He, he can tell you what those dreams mean. And so verse 14, Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Here's Joseph's chance. You can interpret it, Joseph. But notice Joseph's response. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. You see his growth? 
He has gone from self-confidence to God-confidence. It's when you have God-confidence that God can use you. But in Joseph's case, it took time of waiting for Joseph to finally get to the point of putting his trust and all of his confidence in what God could do, not in what he could do. See, that time of waiting was very important for what God wanted to do in Joseph. And that period of waiting was allowing Joseph time to grow. Can you imagine a 17-year-old showing up in Egypt and being ready to save Egypt from a famine? Can you imagine a, a, a man of 20 or 21 years old being ready to step up and be ready to, to advise Pharaoh in such a way that he becomes second in command of all of Egypt? No, it was during this time of waiting that God is refining Joseph teaching him some wisdom, maturing him, getting him ready for the job that God wants to do through Joseph. Why is he asking us to wait? Why is he asking you to wait? Is he providing the right circumstances? Is he, is he wanting you to put your confidence in him, not in yourself? Is there some refining he still needs to do? Something that he wants to happen in your life. Gene Getz said this, The reason we do not grow spiritually more than we do is because we do not wait for God to give us what we need to grow. Now, listen to that again. The reason we do not grow spiritually more than we do is because we do not wait for God to give us what we need to grow. Then he follows that up with the reason we do not perceive God's work in our lives is because we are too busy trying to work things out for ourselves before God has a chance to work. Teach me, Lord, to wait down on my knees till in your own good time. been so conditioned by our culture, by our world, to hate waiting. In some ways it's just human nature, something that Satan plugs into in our lives that causes us not to want to wait. We want it now. We want it instantly. Why do I have to wait? We're like children waiting for Santa Claus to come. Why do we have to wait so long? Father, teach us to wait. Teach us to learn to look toward you during those times of waiting. Strengthen our faith and our confidence in you during those periods of waiting. Help us to rely on you for your timing and your working out of circumstances by your providence during those times of waiting. Help us to resist the temptation to take 
matters in their own hands like Abraham and Sarah during those times of waiting. Help us to rely less on ourselves and our own understanding of things and more on you and your truth and your wisdom during those times of waiting. And Father, bring us out of those times of waiting eventually so that we are strong in you and in your Son and so that we can be used for your purposes. Father, it's hard to say it, but thank you for those times of waiting. There's been times in my own life whenever I've been able to look back and I've been able to see how you've worked through the waiting. And I must admit, I become forgetful so that whenever the next time of waiting comes, I become impatient all over again. So, Father, help me to learn the lessons of waiting and to turn my eyes on Jesus, your Son. Through Him, we thank you and are grateful. Amen. So what lessons do we need from Joseph? Well, number one, how can I use the experience of waiting that I am in to develop my confidence and my faith in God? James 1, verses 2 through 4, and then again, 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9, it talks about those things that were to add to our faith, those virtues that we're to grow in our lives. And and each of those implies waiting. It's not an instant, here, add to your faith knowledge, knowledge, goodness, and goodness. It it isn't all of a sudden thing. It's a a time of waiting. It's a time of of listening to God. It's a time of, of waiting on Him to develop those things in my life. It's the man with the terminal illness who has decided to take his own life rather than letting the ravages of disease take him. I'm going to die, let me just go ahead and die now. But a friend introduces him to the love of God and to the hope of the gospel. And now the man chooses to live the remaining years of his life the best he can, getting to know as much about God as he possibly can, and using those times to bless others in ways that he could never do it before he knew God. Sometimes the waiting brings up something much better. How are you using this experience to listen to God and to rely on God and to turn to Him and look for confidence in Him and to grow in your faith in God? Or am I so busy trying to work things out myself that I rarely have time to look to God and seek Him during that time of waiting? How can I use this experience to allow God to prepare me in the future to use me in the future more than he could possibly use me presently. Is God using this time to prepare me, to get me ready for something he's got in mind for me to do? I don't know what it is. And that's one of the things that makes waiting so hard. I know what's in front of me. I don't know what's down the road. Maybe, what is it that God wants to do? And unfortunately in our world, there's several folks that never find out. There are people that never find out what God can do through them because they never give Him a chance to do it. They don't wait. It's the missionary who was denied a visa to enter a country for which he had prepared so long and hard to go in and and work in. His dream of reaching people in that country was not realized. Now, however, he's training future missionaries who will be going into over 50 countries to hundreds of different people and different groups in order to preach the gospel. God had something bigger in mind for him. But it took the waiting. How is God preparing you for something in the future that is bigger than what you have right now? Something he wants to do. And then is God developing and revealing my character during this time? Is He using this time to refine me? To make me stronger? To make me more faithful? To make me 
make me more like Jesus during this time of waiting. Viktor Frankl said of his experience in a Nazi concentration camp that the only way he survived the ordeal, ordeal was by keeping his focus on the purpose and meaning that God had given to his life. Many of his fellow prisoners perished because they had lost the will to live. Frankel helped many others survive, as he did, by helping them to discover what he held near to himself. During that period of waiting, in fact, I was talking with someone just before class and saying, you know, God's not finished with me yet. God's not done with me yet. There's something more he's got in mind. I don't know what it is. I know what I'd like to be. I know what I'd like to do. And so oftentimes God says, surprise, I've got this instead. And whenever God surprises me, it's always so much better than what I was thinking of. And at the very least, it's always so much better for his purposes than what I was thinking of. One of the things as the staff gets together, Dale and I have had this conversation multiple times. We're in times of planning and times of preparation. What we have noticed is that God seems to do an awful lot more when we get out of his way than whenever we try to plan it for him. How is he refining me? What is he doing during this time of, of, of waiting that's revealing my character? That, that is betraying my impatience? That is betraying my, uh, my, my desire to control everything? So that he can get rid of that in my life. So that I can be moldable and more useful for what he wants me to do. There's one of those lessons up there that each one of us can use this week. Just pick one. Which one will you focus on this week? Will you grow in your God confidence and in your faith in God this week? What will you do to start doing that even more? Will you, will you start turning things over to God more and trusting the future more to Him than I do to me? And, and will I open up my heart and my life so that He can work in my life to develop the character in me that He needs in me so I can be used by Him in some way for that future? Let's pray. Father, we do want to be used by you because your purposes are so much better than ours and your purposes in this world are so much greater than my own purposes for myself so father i i want to pray for all of us that we will completely and wholly submit to you and your purposes for us and if that means waiting for you to work then let us wait and again, keep our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus through that period of waiting so that Satan cannot distract us and turn us away from it and cause us to go after other things in our lives. Thank you for the way you work. In Jesus we pray. Amen.